what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. So without further ado, give it up. Let's give a warm welcome to Don Miller. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, this, is, this is really cool. Uh, and I know we're going to need to project a bit because we're not having mics in the room. We are mic'd for the sense of doing a podcast. But uh, to get us started, Hero on a Mission to me is, I love it because it's like a viewpoint on life and living a meaningful life. You write at the beginning, I don't think any of us should trust fate to write the story of our lives. Fate is a terrible writer. Why was that an author's note that had to go at the beginning of this thing? Well, I think what I'm really arguing for there is an internal locus of control mm -hmm. and personal agency. And, you know, psychologists have done studies. There is an internal locus of control and there is an external locus of control and there are variations in between. And to the degree that people have an internal locus of control or at least adopt one, they are happier, they make more money, they have better marriages, they have better relationships, they experience less anxiety, less clinical depression, on and on and on. What an internal locus of control means is it's a belief system that I believe that basically, for the most part, I'm actually in charge of my own well-being. And an external locus of control in the extremes would be I have no bearing on my well-being. My bearing, the bearing that affects my well-being or plays upon it would be, you know, the government or God or fate or those kinds of things. And uh, I am somebody who believes in God, but I also believe God gives us more of a locus of control than we think. And a lot of the, a lot of the crap that happens in our life is because of you. I think when you accept it, you also get to accept control and direction in your life. Now, obviously, I didn't decide when I was born or how tall I was. or There, you know, there are gradient variations therein, but uh, when I you know, one of the things Viktor Frankl says is the one thing that you can always control is your attitude mm -hmm. and your perspective on what's happening to you. <laughs> you write about four roles. They're the four roles that we play in life, the victim, the villain, the hero, the guide. Can you unpack that for us to, so that we could better understand these four roles we play? Yeah. Well, you know, wh while I was studying Viktor Frankl, uh, parallel something else was happening in, in my life. I'd written a bunch of memoirs and they'd done pretty well. And in order to write those books, I discovered and studied story structure. And story structure is all the stuff that screenwriters study in order to write a good screenplay and get you to watch their movie. Um, and novelists use the same stuff. So, you know, this, there are these story structures that have existed for 2,500 years. Probably Plato, uh, when he wrote uh, 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 Poetics, was the first person to put you know, words to the fact that stories are formulaic. And one of the things that I noticed studying story structure that I didn't think had been written about was that there, there are really four characters in every story. Uh, pretty much every story you encounter. There's going to be a lot of characters, but four of them that will be consistent will be the, the victim, the villain, the hero, and the guide. So the victim is the one who's in trouble, the villain is the one who is making the victim suffer. The hero is the one who's trying to rescue the victim. And the guide is the one who is helping the hero rescue the victim. So, you know, you'll see this, especially the hero guide part, you'll see it in, you know, Lord of the Rings. You've got Bilbo Baggins. You've got Gandalf as the guide. Luke Skywalker is the hero. Uh, Yoda is the guide. Uh, Katniss is the hero. Haymitch is the guide. Uh, Daniel in The Karate Kid is the hero. Mr. Miyagi is the guy. You just see it all across the board. What I, what I realized and what I theorized in this book about is that those four roles exist in story structure and have for 2,500 years, not because there are real villains in the world and there are real victims in the world and there are real heroes in the world, real guides in the world, but because there are victims, villains, heroes, and guides inside of every single one of us. They are essentially the four archetypes that, that you interact with. Uh, in, in your own psyche. And if you, if you believe the way stories work out, the more you identify with the victim, the worse your life is going to go. And the more you identify with the hero, the better your life is going to go. The more you identify with the villain, and we've all done seasons as villains, 
and there's not a person in this room who hasn't done it, uh, the worse your life is going to go. And the more you can identify as the guide, ultimately the more meaning you will experience in life. And so it was worth exploring what these four characters are so that we could recognize them in ourselves. And uh, usually we play the victim, villain, hero guide at some point every day. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, you know, there's, there's just no way around it. Mm -hmm. uh, even self-awareness doesn't totally solve the problem. But, you know, somebody cuts you. I mean, there was a lady on the way here who, there's a thing in Nashville, man, and I, you know, I've only been here 10 years, but it drives me crazy. These are the most polite drivers <laughs> in the world. I mean, it's to the point where at a four-way stop, they will get out of their car and go greet the other person and say, no, please, you. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just, I just want to run these people down. So that's my villain. <laughs> that's my, my villain shows up at a four-way stop. And uh, uh, the villain wants vengeance and wants everything done their way. And basically all the classical sort of narcissistic personality disorder. You know, if you want to read about a villain, just Google that and you'll read about them. Uh, victim believes that they're hopeless, uh, that fate is in control, that there's nothing that they can do. And uh, victim is a, it's a mode that we use to get leverage uh, from people. But ultimately, if you watch stories, nothing ever happens to the victim. They don't change, they don't grow, they don't get rewarded. They're a bit part in the story. The v purpose of the, vi the victim in a story is to make the hero look good and the villain look bad, and that's it. There's no other purpose for the victim in a story. And so when we play victim in our life, that's exactly what happens to us. You just sort of blend in with the wallpaper. Um, heroes, however, accept challenges. Uh, they move toward those challenges. They don't always conquer their challenges, but they, they don't stop trying. Uh, and often they do. Uh, guides usually are older. You'll almost always in a, in a story, the guide will have gray hair. And the reason is, in order to become a guide, you actually have to live as a hero for a pretty long time. You've got to learn whatever the hero learns so that you can turn around and depart that knowledge to somebody else who's 20 years younger than you. And ultimately, when we all became parents, you entered into a transformation at that point. And you started, just in your biochemistry, you literally started to become a guide. And you also figured out how incredibly selfish you were as a human being at that point. <laughs> uh, and your hero's journey began to tie up and your guide journey began to start. And what Viktor Frankl discovered is what, you know, the, when you get into that guide phase of life, which is leveraging what you have and departing it on others, you actually enter into the most meaningful stage of your life. That, that you experienced more you, you experience more happiness and meaning at that point than you do in, in any other previous phase. Sadly, you have to go through the other phases to get there. But so I, you know, I explored that and just talked about what the characteristics of a guide are and how you can recognize them. Because I really think almost like a, a stick shift car, you're in control of what gear you're in. Mm -hmm. And you know, when something happens to you, you can kind of grind into victim mode, but that car is going to stop. Uh, but if you can stay in hero and guide, you're going to be OK. So speaking of living like a meaningful life, you, um, one of the exercises that uh, I've done this with Brooke and, and you write about it is writing your eulogy. Uh, why is this a valuable exercise? Why should everybody in this room, everybody listening, why should they do that right now? And, and not only why, but, but how? What's the proper way to do that? Well, it, you know, it's not my exercise. Uh, it was popularized by Stephen Covey and he got it from somebody else. I can't remember who Covey got it from, but essentially, Writing your eulogy, you know, f foreshadowing in a fictional way as, an, as a creative exercise, your own death, uh, and then writing from that perspective of what will you have wanted to get done by then is a really sobering exercise because you'll start to realize pretty quickly that a lot of the stuff you're working on isn't actually all that important. That you as a mother and as a father and as a spouse and as a friend you know, probably everybody in this room is a three or an eight on the Enneagram. You're probably all high D's on the disc test. We're the easiest to get deceived about what we think is going to matter in the end because, you know, you, you, you put goals in front of us and we eat them for breakfast, right? So to, for me, it was very sobering to realize that, you know, look, uh, I, Betsy and I got married late. I got married at 42. Betsy and I had a baby 
Betsy had the baby, I didn't have it, um, at, when I was 49. So I've got a 15 month old at home. And, uh, and for me, you know, I've got her for 30 years at the most. Doctor says I'm doing good. Uh, so, you know, I'm counting on about 80. Even if I live past 80, I reserve the right to just be a, a, a sort of crotchety old man. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I've got her for 30 years, and so I've got some, some big ambitions, but if those get in the way of time spent with Emmeline, I will regret that. And, but I, you don't know that today. So to be able to write that obituary and then read it and remind yourself day after day of, hey, you're going to regret this, is a really great regulator. Mm -hmm. For other people, it's a really great motivator. Probably nobody in this room needs any motivation. Uh, we probably need the opposite. Uh, Scott Hamilton, you know, the Olympic figure skater, he lives here in town and he's become a friend of Betsy and mine. He hires a trainer to work with him at 60 years old to slow him down. That's the trainer's really? job. Yes. It's to stop him from getting injured, to stop him from overdoing it. To st I don't, that's not the trainer that I need. Uh, and I think, but I think the, a, a good obituary will do that for you and make sure that you're kind of living in that sweet spot where you're experiencing a deep sense of meaning, where we're getting what we want to get done in our careers and social impact, but we're also not, you know, uh, neglecting some of our responsibilities that ultimately give, us, give our hearts a lot of meaning. I struggle with um, long-term vision. I think I can focus on the kind of what's in front of me, I'm gonna work really hard and show up every day and consistently do work. But you talk about both casting your long-term and short-term visions can you share more about how you've done that how maybe we could do that yeah. and become better at both of those things yeah well I'm, I'm also not convinced that everybody has the ability to to sit down and have a long-term vision I've discovered that over time I just thought everybody could do it and a lot of people you know they just don't think that way yeah. and they don't have it um, and so I don't fault anybody for not doing that I tend to be very I tend to be almost the opposite really you know any vision I've got is about tw it'll take about 20 years to get it done Wow. And then you ask me to fill out my taxes right now. I'm like, ah, oh, that's not very important. Uh, and other people have to do that. So there, are, you know, we all have diff different giftings. Uh, I will say though that the the benefit of a long-term vision is you just get so much more work done in the same direction that over a long period of time you can accomplish massive things, hmm. massive, massive things. Like at the beginning of StoryBrand, for example. Is there any way to like? What was there a north star, or how are you thinking about building this thing that became? Uh, what it is. Yeah, some of that was a little bit of uh, of fair of uh, Forrest Gump, you know, just kind of a dumb guy in the right place at the right time. Seriously, I mean. Yeah, a lot of it really was. I hate to how say so? that. Like, what do you mean? Well, you know, I I well, you know, let's just say this, Ryan. You know, if you came to me and you said, Don, I got a book. It's about ancient narrative structures and how they can line up with uh, marketing principles in order to engage groups. I would say, Brian, congratulations, your mother is going to love that book. <laughs> you know, so, so to write that book and have it sell, I think it's, it's nearly 800,000 copies now in the last few years, is, you know, my, pretty mind-boggling to me. Because really, I couldn't have sold, seen it became that. like the template for how many businesses? Thousands upon yeah, thousands yeah. of, you know, tens of thousands of businesses that use that book as their template for building. So, it's like a transformational item. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I, I'm curious about, like, you say you're a long-term vision guy. It's like, wow, how could you have predicted that? You know? Well, part of it was I knew that I was going to move from me the memoir space to the business space. Yep. And I knew there would be a 15 to 20 year run uh, sort of speaking into to businesses and small businesses. You know, the first clients before the book ever came out, when I just released the framework, and I think I, make a, I made a YouTube video about it or something like that, our first client was Procter & Gamble. Wow. And the second client was Ford Lincoln. And Lincoln so you was, had to figure it out. <laughs> we figured it out really quick. And then we beta tested with some small businesses and then you know, released the book and everything else was off to the races. So the long-term vision, you know, 20 year vision was actually to get into the small business space and speak to the business community and transition my career from memoir, a literary, sit around your underwear and write books to put on a sport coat, you know, and, and, and talk about businesses. And so that's been going on for a little, little under 10 years now. Mm -hmm. So to have the first book be what it was and have, have it do what it is was pretty much a gift that I, I wasn't expecting. Hmm. Uh, you know, and sometimes, we all know, sometimes the Hail Mary Pass actually gets caught. It gets caught a lot more if you throw it. Uh, and so, you know, that one got caught.
uh, and I was happy about that. So you, you also written about, um, you've written a book that could be a substitute to getting an MBA uh, when it comes to Business Made Simple. And I think this is a group of people that are really interested to be a value-driven professional. Mm -hmm. And there are characteristics of that person. One of the first ones is the fact that they view themselves as an economic product on the open market. And I remember we've you and I have talked about this before, and that really resonated with me. It still resonates with me. I think about every day of, if I'm not adding value to their lives, I have not earned any right to spend another day with them. Yeah. Uh, I have to view myself as, as a value-added resource every day. And I, I, I part of that is from that conversation we had about viewing myself as an economic product on the open market. So can you share more about why that's so important for all of us as ambitious leaders who want to leave our dent and help other people that that's a good way to, to view the world. Yeah, I think, you know, there's 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 categories of our lives. Yeah. You know, we play roles. Uh, I play the role of father. I play the role of husband. I play the role of business leader. And uh, and I play the role of service provider to customers. You know, within the role of husband, I'm not an economic product. You know, it would be really sad if I came home and my wife just said, you know, you were worth more yesterday than you're worth today, <laughs> which sometimes I feel like is, is, is worthy of being said. That said, though, you know we don't treat each other that way, yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're you know we're in it for the long haul. My daughter doesn't see me that way. Uh, my customers do, and I don't think that makes them bad or makes me bad. You know when 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 you see yourself as a of economic product on the open market uh, it, within your career category, it's true. It's absolutely true. And the only reason people will pay me to sit down and help them come up with a strategy is because I get them a bigger return on that investment than they paid me. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to grow in our careers, you really want to ask yourself, if you, if you want to grow financially, you want to be able, my rule is 10x return on your investment. So if you pay me money, I want you to get a 10x economic return on that investment. And that's how I adjust my pricing. And uh, if I can deliver on that promise, I've got job security indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times we, we don't want to see it that way, but the faster you see it that way, the better. You know, we have, um, we have five interns for the first time ever at my company. I meet with them twice a month, uh, but the rest of my staff is meeting with them three days a week. And two of them live with us. Uh, they'll live with us for 90 days and they happen to be the children of some of my oldest friends and we just are having a blast we're a month in we're having a great time hmm. and it's been an interesting conversation to sit in a boardroom with them or Dagny who's my Paul and Danielle's daughter is living with us she's absolutely adorable and she wants to start a company where she makes f a fashion line a clothing line that has quotes on it that would stimulate conversation that would lead to the end of human trafficking. So we're dealing with a college student, very idealistic, and has great things going on. So I just kind of quietly sat there, and then we finally got her in the conference room, and I said, okay, Dagny, let's figure out how this makes money and why somebody would give you $30 for a T-shirt. At the end of an hour, she couldn't figure out why anybody would give her any money, so we changed the business strategy. <laughs> and so now, as of yesterday, her strategy is she will go to a nonprofit if they pay her $20,000, she will then take their message to a university campus and spend two weeks educating that campus about that message in exchange for the university paying a $20,000 donation to the nonprofit. So they're breaking even on her time. And she now gets to work for a bunch of different nonprofits. She gets to spread t-shirts. She gets to do lectures. She gets to you know, mobilize the student leadership and maybe a celebrity athlete on campus. And, it's a great investment, but what she had to figure out is why would somebody give me 20 grand? Why would the university give 20 grand here? Why is this worth money? And now she will be able to represent 10 or 20 different nonprofits, speak her heart. She had to figure out the economic part of it. And I think when, when anybody can figure out why are you worth money, uh, then people will start, and you can articulate that then people will start paying you money. I'll say one more thing, because it's really important. There's only one reason anybody pays anybody money, because that person can solve a problem. And that's really it. Nobody pays any money for anything that doesn't solve. Hunger is a problem, lunch is the solution. And you bought it, right? 
uh, feeling good about what you're wearing is a problem, going to the Gap or whatever, wherever you buy clothes is the solution to the problem. But if, if as a leader and as a business owner, if you can clearly articulate the problem you solve, your revenue will increase, period. It will increase because people are listening for the solution that you have to a problem that they are experiencing and then they'll part with their dollars in order to solve that problem. Uh, it's also a story formula. The hero has a problem and for the next 90 minutes they're going to try to overcome that problem and it hooks you into that narrative. So when, you know, real quick, if, I, if you and I were at a cocktail party and we met two different people who do the exact same thing and I said to the first one, what do you do? And they said, well, I'm, a, I'm an at-home chef. I come to your house and cook. That's interesting. You'd probably start a conversation. Where did you go to school? And have you ever cooked for anybody famous? And what's your favorite restaurants? You would be polite. And then you'd walk away. The next person who does the exact same thing, charges the same money, and offers the same value, you say, what do you do? And they say, well, you know how most families don't eat together anymore? And when they do, they don't eat healthy? I'm an at-home chef. So which person is going to do more business, chef one or chef two? two. I've asked that question to 10,000 people. I've never gotten chef one. I've only gotten chef two. Why? They do the same thing at the same price and offer the same value. The reason is that Chef 2 positioned their service as the solution to a problem. And if you position your service as the solution to a problem, people will pay you more for it. And the worse the problem is, the more they will pay. And so if you want to make a lot of money in the world, go find a really a problem that's costing people an enormous amount of money and then solve it. Yeah. So how about inside a company, building a career, uh, whether you have a boss or whatever, uh, that same message, but in that different arena. Well, even if you're getting, even if you're on the payroll for a company, you are your own company. If you interviewed with me and you said, Don, I'm super creative. Here are the ideas that I came up with. I'm a visionary strategist leader. You would not be worth very much money to me because we have that covered. But if you said, Don, I see you're a visionary strategist leader, my guess is you don't like to check in with every member of your team every day. I love operating a business. I've never had a creative idea in my life. But I love checking in with every day and making sure everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing and they're doing a good job and they have the support they need. I'd pay you $250,000. And, and the reason I know that is because I do. I have a guy, <laughs> that position is taken, and I pay him a quarter million dollars. Because he has a skill set that I do not have and I need that skill set to round out my team. He solves a problem for me. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I say to our interns, if you're gonna enter the workforce and you know how to solve problems, you have to understand you are worth more on the open market. This was true, a friend of mine who, uh, who was president of my company before he moved on to uh, Honeywell, but he, his son was a junior in college and he had gone through Business Made Simple, the book that, that, uh, that I wrote on this topic and had taken a bunch of the courses in our online platform and he's interviewing for a job. Somehow he got into this interview before he got, had a college degree and they said, hey, listen, we really like you. We want you to come back next year when you have a college degree. Uh, unfortunately, this position requires a college degree and he said, totally understand. They said, great. Well, let's keep in touch and it's so great meeting you and he said, can I just say a few things before I go? And the guy said, yeah, the guy doing the interview said, absolutely. He goes, hey, I just want you to know if you did hire me, this is what I would do in the first 90 days. I would try to convince you to rewrite your mission statement because it's not a mission statement and it's not clear. It doesn't include a mission. It's not going to mobilize anybody. In fact, if I asked anybody in this office what the mission statement was, nobody would know. And then he said, I'm going to clarify the message on your website because you are not positioned to solve a problem and that's going to increase your revenue. Uh, and, you know, and he went on. Uh, you know, I would adopt five different meetings in order to organize this staff. And this thing. The guy stopped him and said, can you just stop talking? He went and he got the CEO of the company and he brought him in and he said, can you tell him the thing about what's wrong with our mission statement? And then they opened up the website. He said, what would you change about this? Well, I'd move this here. Here's, I wouldn't say this. That's confusing everybody. I would actually say this and blah, blah. They hired the guy. Mm -hmm. And the reason is they smelled value. But the only time that you know, anybody smells value is when you say, you have this problem and I solve it with this. And if you can become known as the person who knows how to scale up a company or knows how to inspire a sales team or knows how to take a brick and mortar store into the digital space or you know, whatever it is, and you can kind of own that territory and become known for that, you can start charging a lot more for your services. 
and you can become known in other organizations and people will start bidding on you. Uh, I'm going to ask one more and then open it up. So think about some, some thoughts or questions you have for Don. Um, I, uh, I have people reach out a lot and say like, hey, I either want to write a book or uh, I'm going to start a podcast. I'm about to start a podcast. And they'll have these kind of ideas and they'll, they'll talk a lot about it. And sometimes, you know, you follow up afterwards and <clears throat> I find there was a lot of talk, not so much on the yeah. action yeah. part. And one of the characteristics of, of, of these professionals you've written about is the fact that they have a bias for action, a bias towards action. Now, I think in here, we probably got that, but I still, I think it's worth it for us to think about it so that we continue to be intentional to have this kind of bias to being, I don't like bifurcating the world, but in a world of talkers and doers, sure, to yeah. being a doer. Yeah. Well, for me, it, 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 was, it took a long time to get there, but I've been there for a decade or so. Um, you know, owning those first, first two things, knowing what your primary tasks need to be, uh, understanding what, your, what the most important thing for you to work on actually is, and then doing those and they're, they're all content creation, they're all writing. Uh, if I can just do that, the rest of the day can spiral out of control and I'll still get more done in that year than almost anybody else that I know. Mm -hmm. it, it's really just owning those two things. What's the most important thing I need to work on? And then I'm gonna do that every morning from eight to 10 or eight to 11, morning after morning after morning after morning uh, for years and years. Uh, nobody will be able to compete with you uh, if you're able to do that. And uh, to me, that, that's, the, that's the, probably one of the biggest just tactical discoveries I've ever made in my career. And it's, it's just shocking what all you can get done uh, if you're able to own that time. In terms of writing a book or starting a podcast, um, one, do it. Uh, there's an order in which I would do it, just having done this so many times. Um, I would actually not start with a book. I would start with a keynote presentation. Mm. Uh, even if you're just going to deliver it to your family. <laughs> you know, uh, they don't get to eat until they listen to mom speak. Uh, so, you know, because what that does is it forces you to clarify your message. Yeah. And there's a filtering process that you go through before you write the book. And that's just going to save you enormous amounts of time. And then, really, the difference between people who finish the book and people who don't is you have to move, you have to mark out those times in the hours, in the morning, those hours in the morning, and you have to just keep doing it for up to 18 months. And you, and you have to do it, it's like climbing a mountain in the fog. You really don't know where the top of this thing is. And it can be very, very debilitating. Mm -hmm. But if you just enjoy walking uphill for two hours every morning, you're going to get there. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, just the, the process writing creates clarity of thought. And so totally. the, every, every leader in here, even if you don't publish it, should be doing having some sort of a writing practice. I've beat this drum for a very long time because I, because I felt it. Yeah. I, I sold a, uh, wrote a proposal to write a book about becoming a manager for the first time, right? And uh, when you write a proposal, you don't write the whole book. You just write Basically, they care most about the marketing plan and do they think that you can move books, but then you write some sample chapters and you turn it in. And I turned it in and I, I honestly thought like, they're, it's, they're probably not gonna, I'm probably not gonna get a deal. Uh, and then all of a sudden you get a deal. And then they say, well, you, better, you gotta finish this book in whatever, six, 10 months. <laughs> yeah. And I think, oh my God, I actually have no idea what I'm talking about. Like it, it, I, it took me a while. You like, will ten months later. Absolutely, <laughs> and then by the time it was done, I had changed my mind on some things. Yeah. But you yeah. know what happened though, Don? I got very clear on what I thought and what I believed through the process of getting that out of your head onto the page. Even though I, th I thought I knew what I was talking about, yeah. Until I had to get all of it out and get it onto the page. So that's why I think all of us would benefit from having so any sort of practice, even if you don't publish it as a book. I'd love for you to publish it as some sort of a book, blog, whatever it may be, because I just felt the power of what that can do for you as yeah. a leader and yeah. being clear on what you believe. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, who wants to go first? Let's uh, open it up. Questions? Who's gonna go? Go ahead, Ali. Uh, what's your favorite story? Like, like period? Yeah. Story 
story uh, at all? Favorite story. Well, the interns who live with us have been asking this question every night. It's been a recurring uh, thing. Uh, you know, there's probably categories uh, that I would have to, you know, dive into. I don't know that I've got an actual favorite story. Uh, probably the, one of the most guiding stories of my life actually comes out of the book of Genesis. It's the story of Joseph, uh, a Jew who was cast out from his family, ended up being sold into Egypt and became the second most powerful person in the world uh, as a Jew, and Egyptians hated Jews. So, you know, it's a pretty incredible story. Uh, gosh, we introduce, you know, these, these uh, interns, you know, Betsy and I introduced them to The Sixth Sense the other night, that movie, because they didn't know about the ending. Oh. By the way, congratulations. You are now old enough that you can introduce adults to movies, and they don't know about the ending. <laughs> but it was so fun to kind of just peek over and see them <laughs> getting scared and doing all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, M. Night Shyamalan is pretty great. Um, the book that actually influenced my career the most is probably J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Uh, because he had such a magical voice that was so common and uh, able to follow, and you could just read it with no effort. And I'd never experienced any, anybody who could write like that before. Uh, East of Eden is a, is a masterpiece in terms of how that story is, is structured, and Steinbeck's ability uh, you know, is pretty incredible. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's hard, very hard to answer that question. When you yeah. watch a movie, are you almost a critic of how the story unfolds to you? I'm not you? a critic. I'm, I'm so glad I don't have that bone. Yeah. But I am constantly trying to figure out what they're doing okay. and where this thing is going. I mean, yeah. we watched, uh, we don't watch that many movies at the house, but with the interns, they're making us now. They're like, well, show us the next one. So we watched uh, Signs last night. Remember Mel Gibson yeah. gets visited by aliens? Yeah, yeah. And it was really fun. There's a scene where you know, the brother is signing up for the army, or he's thinking about signing up for the army, and somebody else in the recruitment center brings up the fact that he had a minor league baseball home run record. He hit, hit, hit one 507 feet. And so I turned to the interns and said, by the way, you would never say in a movie that somebody can hit a ball 507 feet unless in act three he's going to be holding a baseball bat and he's going to be hitting something with it. Because mm. you never, ever, there's no wasted words in a movie. You know, some, a sheriff picked up a baby monitor and said, you know, this can be used as a walkie-talkie. And I said, that will be used as a walkie-talkie later. They needed us to know that. Right. So that blah, blah, blah. So they're kind of watching going, why would they say that? You know, you know that sort of thing. So um, I do study, you know, the, the economy of words and the efficiency that you need to have if you want to engage somebody in a story. You just can't write a book and have wasted words. Yeah. They've, they've all got to be heading towards something trying to prove a point. Yep. Can you speak more, like, practically, you talked about how your company culture is going to be better than you found them? Yeah. Like, how do you make that happen practically, like, day to day? Yeah, so a lot of what we've already talked about in this room, I need you to understand what problem you solve for this company and be able to articulate it. That is your value proposition to me. And if you come in and you say, well, I'm really great at making people happy and I'm really great at remembering birthdays, that is awesome. I love that. That's a $12 problem, and I'm so glad you're going to solve it. I'll give you 12 bucks. What else you got? <laughs> right? Because a Hallmark card will do that, and they're cheap. So not that it's not important. That's super important. But we've got to be able to solve you know, some bigger problems. And you know, some people, they kind of ruffle at that. But then when they figure out how valuable they really are, it makes them proud. And so that's the sort of transformation that I want to see happen in members of my team, uh, that, gosh, you're really good at figuring this thing out. And so and they kind of don't know it until you go to them and say, you realize how valuable that is, that you're able to take this HubSpot you know, uh, CRM and track customers and figure out if they do this behavior, they're likely to buy this, so we need to put a lead generator in front of them right at this point. You know how, you know how valuable that is? It's very, very valuable. Thank you for doing that. And so it's that sort of thing. Then they, they use it against you when they negotiate for their raise. But that's OK. Uh, so as leaders, to articulate value, to articulate, here's what I see in you and why that is so valuable. One is they will double down on that, right? And so you're going to get more of that problem solving. Uh, and two, you are building into them very, very real self-esteem. Love it. Alec? <clears throat> 
Good. I'm a, uh, I'm a college senior, I'm 22 years old. What is one piece of advice that you could give me that you wish you knew at 22 years old that you know now? Well, that's contextual. Uh, at 22 years old, I would have started studying story and story structure, and I really didn't start studying that till I was in my late 30s. Uh, so I would have gotten an eight-year jump on that because I built my whole career on that. Um, but that's pretty contextual. I think it's the same thing. Is it Alec? Yeah. I think it's the same thing that I've been saying, Alec, and that's, that's even at 22 years old, you want to figure out a market-based problem that you can solve. And uh, that will change over the years. Um, you know, but if you always have in your head, this is, what, this is the problem I solve and here's what it's worth, you're not going to struggle financially because very, very few people are able to do that. In his case, so uh, uh, Alec and I played at the same high school, obviously not at the same time, but he wants to be a general manager of a professional sports team, and I actually believe that he will. Totally doable. I believe it. But if, if in that case, and I think we can use this as an example, a lot of people want that job. What are ways... Because to me, to him, I'm thinking like you got to find ways to solve problems and sometimes even solve problems that these people don't even know exist. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and so I'm curious what you think about that element of something, a yeah. very competitive thing that a lot of people would do almost for nothing uh, in order to make, your, make, make hay, especially when you're young. Yeah. You know, if I were in your shoes, Alec, right now, I would, I would start a, a paper, a research paper, a white paper, on best practices among sports GMs. And I would come up with the 10 things that GMs do in order to win and the 10 mistakes that they make that cause losses, financial losses, all that kind of stuff. One, that's gonna give you access to GMs, right? And two, it's going to give you uh, knowledge on how to be a great GM and how to not be a bad one. Then I would take that white paper and I would leverage that into an executive assistant position for a GM that you want to work with. So I would first go to the GM of the Orlando Magic, and I would say, I, I thank you for interviewing from this. I wanted you to see my findings. And um, I just want you to know, if you want to duplicate the top 10 and not duplicate the, the bottom 10, I'd love a position on your staff to help specifically you do a better job. I, I don't know that you're going to get that one, but you're going you're gonna to interview with five people, and one of them is going to give you a job. Right now, you've skipped the assistant coach, and you've and you probably in the you know the financial and the ticket office, and you've skipped the marketing, you know, assistant to the marketing. Guy. You're at the very top now, and then you got another problem. You will be seen as the world's greatest assistant to a GM, which is a light years away from a GM, right? And then you're going to want to go get the job that is most often promoted to GM, and so you are three jobs away from being a general manager rather than 27 jobs away from being a general manager. You skipped 23, 25 jobs by being smart and writing that white paper. That's what I would do. I think <clears throat> putting stuff out in the world, as mentioned earlier today, Gabby and I were talking about this at lunch, creates the, any, is there, if there's ever a way to create magnetic force to you, that's, that's why this whole event is ha happening, you know? There's some sort of, I try to put out good stuff and there's some of it comes back and it ends up being a lot of great people. <clears throat> it's very similar, like Alec, right? Like this is a way to create something coming to you by actually doing the hard work of the thing that not everybody's willing to do. Other, yeah, go ahead. You know, the other thing that I would say really quick, Alec, is it's gonna be, it, you're gonna feel really arrogant and you're gonna come off as a little bit delusional. Um, How's that for a preface before I tell you what to do? Uh, I think you need to get your sound bite down now for people that you talk to, just, and, and, and you need to be able to tell people that I want to be the general manager of a sports team, a sports franchise someday. The way I would word that is, you know, I, I know I'm young, but I'm convinced that most general managers actually don't know how to monetize a sports franchise for all it's worth. I'm going to figure that out, and I want to be a really great general manager someday. That will lock in somebody's mind, and you will differentiate for the rest of your career. They will see that you're not ready, but they will know that that's where you're going to head. And if you keep doing that for about 10 more years, then you're going to be in a position for somebody to say. Because if you become known as an assistant to a GM, you're never going to get out of that. 
You've got to be the assistant who wants to be a GM someday. And then people start opening doors for you. Love it. Yep, go ahead. Parker, second. Uh, distinct moments in your life where you um, really started to understand, like, this is what I'm really good at, this is not what I'm really good at, and I need to pay somebody $250,000 to run this side of my business. Like, yeah. Are there any like moments that really stick out, or was there a process that you went through to discover that? Uh, I'd be curious to yeah, you know, early on I wrote this book called Blue Like Jazz, and I wrote it 20-something years ago. And um, it was the second book I'd ever written. The first book did not do well. And the, like the second paragraph of that book, as I started writing that book, there was a moment where I wanted to write something that was pretty self-deprecating. I think specifically it was that I was a bedwetter until I was like seven. It, you know, and I was, it was sort of embarrassing to me, even though it's not actually all that, all that embarrassing. Um, and I wrote it, and I deleted it, and I wrote it, and I deleted it, and then I put it back in, and I kept going. That, in hindsight, was a p pivotal moment, not just in my writing career, but in my life. Because what I discovered is when I finished that book and put it out, that book spent 42 weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list. And what I discovered is that you can actually air your dirty laundry, and nobody cares. And you can, you can actually be honest about your mistakes, and you can metabolize those mistakes and learn from them, and you only get stronger. And people who deny their shortcomings or their liabilities or their mistakes or their character flaws, their, their career is capped. Because the only way we actually get better is to be honest about the things that we've done, the mistakes that we've made, learn how to not do them again, and move forward. I was at a, a, a meeting with 350 mental health practitioners recently in Chicago. And one of them, we were just talking, I, I don't know how we got on this, we were talking about dating or something like that, and she said, you know, I always tell ladies, choose a man who has a story to tell, not a man who tells stories. I said, what do you mean by that? She goes, a story to tell is, here's how I screwed up, here's what I did to fix it, and here's who I am now. A story, a person who tells stories has never actually done the work so that they have a story to tell. Hmm. They're just selling. And I hope that I'm the guy who has a story to tell. So a big foundational part, I think, of my career is, this, is, is early on just discovered that you can be pretty darn honest about your, your shortcomings. And some people are going to go, well, I kind of screwed that up, so I'm not going to follow them. But the majority of people go, that's somebody I can trust because they've actually metabolized their mistakes and they won't make them again. Um, that was a big, that was probably a big, uh, you know, moment for me that would translate probably to a group of leaders. What, what did you see in that young man in the Apple going on to do great things? Well, you know, I, I had an assistant for seven or eight years, Tara. She was incredible. And she let me know. She gave me a six-month notice, <laughs> which is really, really kind. Uh, and so I, you know, Tara and I sat down and said, what are we looking for to replace her? I said, you know, I don't know that I'm looking for an executive assistant. I need somebody, this was 10 years ago, who can work for about 50 grand, who can actually run a company should I take my writing and speaking business and turn it into something more. And we looked for three or four months and couldn't find anybody. We happened to fly here to Nashville. We did an event. We flew back. About a week later, I got together with Tara, and I said, I think I found our guy. And she goes, she goes no, I, I actually found our guy. And we had both separately run into the same guy Whoa. in Nashville. Not at the Apple store. He was actually helping some, one of the speakers who was speaking at one of my conferences. And uh, I thought, well, that's a sign. And I think that was a big part of it. Uh, but what I, I think what I saw is he just had a, he had a very charismatic, trusting sort of presence. You could tell at once that he was very positive, loved people, and he was very ethical. And I just thought, that's our guy. These days, I would have a lot more criteria than that. But we, you know, 50 grand, you can't be picky about who you're, you're hiring. And uh, brought him on, and he took. We were. I was a quarter million dollar writer and speaker, and he took us past 10 million. And to be honest, at 10 million, he no his skill set was no longer able to run the company. Um, I really appreciate this, man. Ma, really this has cool been a blast. Came in, came in person to hang out and and really put on a show for everybody here and. and uh, I'm just grateful for you, man. So thank you so much. Let's give it up for Don Miller. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you.